Today is April 10th, and for our briefing, we are incredibly blessed. Today we have Jonathan Shanzer. Many of you know Jonathan, the senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Jonathan played an extremely crucial role in his time in the Treasury Department. He was involved in one of the key figures in the sanctions on Iran in terms of the Iranian economy and stop trying to stop their nefarious nuclear plans, their, their ballistic missile plans, etc. And Jonathan, for the last number of years, has played an incredible role being an advisor to governments, an advisor to policymakers, in his role as a senior fellow at the defend, at FDD. That Jonathan is on his way to the Middle East, so we're extremely grateful to him today because on his way, he's made time to address us, to speak to us. And what's been happening over the last couple of weeks has been, to put it mildly, disconcerting. It's been challenging, and it's a time of trepidation. It's a time of insecurity. And Jonathan is going to shed light on that. Before we, we have Jonathan start, on behalf of all of us who've been participating in these briefings, we want to wish a mazel tov to Yehuda. Yehuda is the person that runs the back, the back end of this. He's the one that records. He's the one that runs it from the studio. You never get a chance to see his face, but he and his wife just had their third children, and we want to thank him. Literally, he hasn't had much sleep over the last couple of days, but he's here to record. And Yehuda, thank you very much for everything that you do. Jonathan, it's an honor and a privilege, and thank you for squeezing us in before your trip to the Middle East. Oh, it's my pleasure, Steve, and, and appreciate working with you and your team. You guys are doing great work out there. Uh, and always pleased to uh, to speak to your uh, to your audience. Um, I, I can, if you'd like, I can just give you a quick overview of how I see things, and we can take it from there. Um, but look, I, you know, I will say right now that I'm hard pressed to think of another time in American history that our politics have so thoroughly influenced uh, a foreign war. In other words, not a war that America is fighting. It's one thing to see American politics seep into, uh, you know, the war in Vietnam or the war in Iraq or the war against ISIS or the Taliban. I understand how our politics uh, are brought to bear. What is so surprising to me right now is that uh, our politics are weighing in heavily and influencing the battlefield with an American ally, Israel, fighting against a terrorist organization designated here in the United States, Hamas, that is funded and armed by a state sponsor of terrorism designated here in the United States. And of course, um, talking about Iran here. This is shocking to me to see the extent to which our politics have crept into the equation. I understand that, of course, you know, the $3.8 billion a year that the United States provides Israel, which is, of course, mostly spent here in the United States, that gives the United States skin in the game. Um, and we have, I think, a uh, we have the kind of alliance with Israel where we should be able to weigh in on when we think they're making mistakes. But this is, I think, beyond that. Uh, and it's troubling to watch because, of course, the entire U.S.-led um, uh, region, the, the Middle East structures that we have created now hang in the balance. Iran appears to be quite pleased with the pause that we have demanded from the Israelis. Uh, Hamas is clearly quite pleased, and they seem to be digging in their heels with uh, the negotiations over the hostages. The Qataris seem pleased with this as well. Um, the only you know, party that looks like they're losing ground right now appears to be the Israelis. So it, it does seem very strange to me right now that we've allowed our politics to creep into the picture so much to the extent that Israel is now suffering the consequences on the battlefield. Now, I will say that the Israelis are still in, in a good spot, all things equal. I know that they've just removed an entire division from the battlefield in Gaza, and people are describing that as a defeat. I'm not sure that it is. I, uh, from what I understand, this division could use a breather. They've been battling uh, hard-fought battles in Gaza for the last five months. The Israeli uh, military, the IDF, is now uh, intent upon giving them some time with their families to give them time to reset and recuperate, knowing that right now the immediate challenge in front of uh, the Israelis is to get 1.4 million displaced people out of the town of Rafah. 
They need to be moved from there to other places further north or along the coast of Gaza. These are the preferred spots identified by the Israelis. At that point, then the Israelis have, I think, the opportunity to go in and finish the job. And remember, Rafa is the last bastion. This is the last spot where there are significant military uh, uh, command centers uh, associated with Hamas. They're, they say that there's somewhere between four to 8,000 fighters, primarily in the tunnels beneath the town of Rafa. And Israel will have the opportunity to uh, to have that last battle. And I do believe it will be the last battle, the last major battle of this war. The, the, I think the real question after that will be, uh, you know, when the U.S. gives a green light for the Israelis to do this. I, I have to hope anyway that it won't be after November. I think it should be a lot sooner than that. My guess is that it could be as soon as a month if the Israelis can show that they have a plan that meets President Biden's needs. But again, the the politics of all of this is what troubles me because I don't believe that this is about strategy. It's not about tactics. I believe that increasingly this is about politics. The president does not like how this war is reflecting on him and among his base. So the Israelis need to get through that with the president. It does seem like there is a better conversation happening right now between the White House and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office. Let's hope that those conversations continue to be productive. And then the last thing I'll just say here is there are some concerns about what happens when Israel goes into Rafah, not because of the, the, the war plans that Israel has, but because there is going to be tension between Egypt and Israel. Uh, the Egyptians are very likely responsible for allowing maybe a dozen or more tunnels that have continued to operate for the last five years or more. These are the tunnels that have supplied Hamas with the weapons that they use against Israel. These are the tunnels that have allowed Hamas fighters to come and go out of the Gaza Strip and to train in places like Iran, where they got the training that they needed for the 10-7 slaughter. So there could be some very difficult moments ahead for Israel and its longest lasting peace partner in the region, the Egyptians, my guess, is that they will have a lot to atone for and a lot to explain. When you say that about the Egyptians, that was that done strategically or was that a function just of sloppy military? Where no, you had it, you know, it's a, soldiers it's a, taking it. Yeah, it's a great question, and I wish I knew the answer. And, and I, I got to say, what I am picking up now from my uh, my contacts in the region, no one wants to talk about this directly. They tell you what they're hearing. They tell you what they think they might know. But nobody says you can go ahead and print this. They're just saying we think that there's going to be some, you know, we're, we're going to find some unpleasant surprises. I think there's three ways that we could interpret what happened here. One is that the Egyptian military or the Egyptian government just simply had no idea what was going on and that it was unprofessional. But I got to tell you something. This is a police state. This is an autocracy. The idea that the military or that the regime of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi didn't know that this was happening strikes me as highly, highly unlikely. They, they have police everywhere. They have intelligence everywhere for exactly these purposes. So then that leaves us to the other two options. One is that perhaps the Egyptians were offered money. Um, and, and that is quite possible because, as you probably know, the Egyptian economy has been in a tailspin for the last, gosh, 10 years. I mean, really, since the Arab Spring, uh, the economy there has been a disaster. And it's even worse now, uh, I should note, because of the Houthi crisis in the Red Sea. The Houthis have stopped more than 50% of the traffic that would normally go through the Suez Canal, which is a major moneymaker for Cairo. So it could be that money was dangled and, and that the regime was desperate enough to take it. Now, we can take our guesses as to who that might have been that offered the money. Maybe it was the Iranians. Maybe it was the Qataris. Maybe it was Hamas itself. But these are things that I'd like to learn if and when all of this comes to light. The last option that I, at least that I've thought about here is that perhaps the Egyptians were being threatened. That perhaps the Iranians or Hamas or Al-Qaeda or the Muslim Brotherhood or some combination thereof were threatening to destabilize the regime and that the regime felt that it had no choice but to acquiesce to allow for a small number of tunnels to operate uh, on that border. But I will tell you that whatever happens next, 
if the Israelis are to have any success in stabilizing Gaza for the future, they're going to need to secure that one small border known as the Philadelphia Corridor. The borders along Israel, you know, right, the, the, the longest border, the longest land border that goes north to south uh, along alongside Israel, that's secure. That northern border, that small border near Ashkelon, also secure. The sea border, also secure from what we understand. The Israeli Navy has done a good job of keeping uh, bad actors out and, uh, and, and keeping the bad guys contained. It's the Egyptian border, that Philadelphia corridor is the one that we don't know enough about. But it, I mean, logic stands right now that that is where the weapons and the fighters have been coming from. And it needs to be shut down. There needs to be a hopefully a quiet conversation, not an ugly eruption, but a quiet conversation. And I should just note parenthetically that Antony Blinken, the secretary of state, was actually in Cairo about two and a half weeks ago having meetings they were relatively quiet meetings, right? We didn't see a lot of media covering it, which I think maybe is a good sign. Maybe it means that we're tackling this problem finally. And certainly it's a good sign that the U.S. is involved. Jonathan, I saw, I touched in my own hands, the Russian, the North Korean, the Iranian, the Chinese bombs, rockets, thermobarometric bombs that were brought over by the Nukba on October 7th. That's just the, the ones that weren't used, the ones that were confiscated by the IDF. It's just, I mean, it's scary. You know, the, the amount of bombs and, and the, the, the variety of bombs that they have. And what we're hearing is it may not even be only through the tunnels. It may be that they've paid off Egyptian soldiers at the border, at the crossing itself, where they've allowed stuff to go through which again may not be a function that it came from the higher ups. It could be the guys working on the border make a small salary. They get paid a lot of money to look the other way and to turn turn the other way. But you're saying it's probably much more high level than what I'm trying to explain. Yeah, I mean, look, you're right about the wide variety and, and the volume, and it is concerning. Uh, but, you know, look, we, we've seen that that things have come across above ground. Um, in fact, right before this war, I think it's really interesting, the Israelis stopped a shipment uh, of material that had come in from Turkey and that there were apparently a massive amount of explosives embedded in what was described as civilian materials that were coming in for humanitarian purposes. So, you know, we, we know the Turks are bad actors here and that they've probably been providing more uh, military support than even what the Israelis interdicted. Um, but yeah, I think there are things that are coming across overland, which does, of course, raise the question now of when this pier is built, right? When the U.S. establishes this humanitarian pier, and that should be coming soon, and you know, humanitarian assistance starts to flow from the uh, uh, from from Cyprus. Who's tracking this, right? Who's looking at it? There are ways to sniff out chemical, biological, and nuclear agents. There are ways to take x-ray snapshots of large containers to see whether there are very clear indications of weapons, for example, or you know, identifiable hardware. But then there's the dual use stuff, the rocket uh, explosives, the, some of the dual use materials that can be converted into um in, into rockets and other bombs and these are the things that you know again we think the egyptians may be turning a blind eye again it could be done at a tactical level it could be done by just those low level uh you know uh, uh officers that are just looking to line their pockets and, and and put food on the table but again my sense is that in egypt right in a in a system like that where it is heavily controlled by the intelligence services and heavily monitored by the top, I would be shocked given how important this agreement is or has been historically for the Egyptians, this agreement with Israel. Can you talk a little bit, you mentioned the Turks. We know that even though the Muslim Brotherhood has been thrown out of Saudi Arabia, it's been expelled from the Emirates, it's illegal in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood, which is at least 50% of the citizens living in Gaza, is is championed is uh, is is a way of life in Turkey. Talk to us a little bit about the Turks, about Erdogan, the Muslim Brotherhood relationship, and the support of terrorism coming from Erdogan. 
Look, I mean, I'll tell you, we've done a lot of work on Turkey at FDD. And I can remember that when we started, people thought we were crazy because the Turks are NATO allies, right? What are we doing at FDD tracking the malign activities of a NATO ally? You know, people were saying, you know, don't you have anything better to look at? But look, if you go back to 2010, right, there's a flotilla that that Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, is now threatening to send to Israel. You remember the last time there was a flotilla that was 2010, and they sent over a bunch of thugs that were associated with Hamas and that some of whom actually even had connections to Al Qaeda. Um, going back a ways, the what's known as the IHH. This is the charity that that uh, so-called charity that that organized the flotilla. Well, they ended up getting into a battle with Israeli naval commandos on the high seas. People were killed. It was a disaster. And this was a clearly provocative action engineered by the Hamas-supporting, jihadist-supporting regime in Turkey. Now, since then, we've seen a lot of ugly things come out of Turkey. They helped Iran evade sanctions to the tune of $20 billion, with a B, Steve. We're talking about a huge amount of money Right at the time that we were trying to prevent Iran from going nuclear, we were trying to place those sanctions on Iran to convince them to step back from the nuclear brink. The Turks undermined that without question. When we saw the rise of ISIS, it was the Turks that were allowing a lot of these jihadis to fly into Istanbul and then to take buses uh, and, and other transport out to the southeastern border to cross over into Syria and fight for the Islamic State. The MIT, the, the security services for the Turkish regime, they were involved in this from the get-go. And then comes the part that we're all watching right now, which is that the Turks have allowed for a massive Hamas headquarters to be built in Turkey. It's in Istanbul. They're operating in the light of day. There were a ton of people that came from that 2011 Gilad Shalit prisoner swap, right? You remember, it was about a thousand Hamas prisoners that were released in exchange for one man for Gilad Shalit, who had been captured in 2006. And so a large number of those Hamas operatives found their way to Turkey and Erdogan gave them an office. And so they do fundraising there. They do political activity, but more importantly and more worryingly, we have seen senior leaders operating there, including the late Salah al aruri who was killed in Lebanon on January 2nd in an IDF airstrike. He was the one who planned and coordinated the, if you recall, the triple kidnapping and homicide of those three teens in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria. That was engineered by a guy who had been based in Turkey. And when he got up at the end of that 2014 war, he was at a major convention. He got up in front of a thousand people, including the deputy prime minister of the, the, the Republic of Turkey. And he announced that he was responsible for that attack. And he received a standing ovation. This is the regime in Turkey right now. They are full on jihadists. They are anti-Western. They do not belong in the NATO alliance. But there is this problem here, Steve, and that is that there is no mechanism for booting a country out of NATO. We joke that it's like the Hotel California. You can check out, but you can't leave. There is no way of getting them out. And this is a major problem. The fox is in the hen house right now. The Turks are responsible for a huge amount of what happened on 10-7 and a whole bunch of other problems that we have yet to tangle with. And we don't know how to get them out of this alliance. Some people say we shouldn't. I would say we have no choice given what we've seen. Yeah. Look, he, this he's not necessarily the most stable individual, but this man is bent upon having a caliphate. You know, he thinks, look, there was a, there were hundreds of years where you had this great Ottoman caliphate, and he wants to restore that. In the sense you get very much like in Russia, the average Russian person supports Putin in conquering the Ukraine because they don't believe there is such a thing as Ukraine. It should be part of Russia. So to the Turks do not believe there should be a state of Israel. That should be part of the Ottoman Caliphate. And it's it's not like he's a pariah amongst his own people. The only, the only thing this guy has done terrible is he's a disaster economically. But in terms of his theology, in terms of his ideology, it seems like he's pretty popular.
He, well, it's interesting. He has been popular, although there were just uh, local elections that just took place in Turkey last week. Uh, and my colleague Sinan Gidi at, at uh, FDD uh, is a Turkish speaker. Uh, he follows that closely. Erdogan got shellacked in the local elections. So his party, the AKP, now this is, we're talking about mayors here, right? Municipalities. But what we're actually seeing is that his allies uh, at a local level lost all of the major cities. They are reeling right now. And so a lot of people are saying that that was a referendum on Erdogan's um, economic policies, which you rightly point out have been a disaster for the people. But I think they're also beginning to wonder, you know, is this all what Erdogan's doing? Is it benefiting the, the people of Turkey? What I would argue is that it is increasingly putting Turkey in isolation. It's interesting. The Turkish government just came out the other day with 54 items that they're saying that they are going to refuse to send to Israel. Because we know that Turkey is actually one of Israel's larger trading partners, right? We talk about billions of dollars that, that go back and forth between the two countries. So he's now trying to even take things a step further um, but I think all it's going to do is hurt him because at some point the Israelis are going to say, you know what, we're not flying through Istanbul airport anymore. We're going to go someplace else and we're going to start boycotting, you know, Turkish products and, and it's going to hurt him. And, and I think Erdogan's already feeling it. The economics uh, of Turkey are, are a disaster. They're getting propped up by the Qataris. Uh, they're selling assets to the Saudis and the Saudis, if you remember, there's bad blood there between the Turks and the Saudis. It was the Turkish government that exposed the murder of Khashoggi back in 2018, that American uh, writer who was chopped up and killed at a Turkish consulate. Um, this is the, uh, or the Saudi consulate in, in Turkey. Um, this is not going well. And after now uh, more than 20 years of one man rule in Turkey, my sense is that maybe, just maybe if we're lucky, the people are getting tired of him and maybe we'll see him ushered out. The Turkish military, he really purged it of people who were not his supporters. Could you describe to us, is the Turkish military today behind Erdogan? Uh, do they support the, the policy, the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood? Do they support Hamas, Qatar, and all the other nefarious actors, all the other slime of the earth that they've been in bed with? It's a really good question. And look, what we know is that in 2016, there was a coup attempt. Uh, it was uh, carried out by, you know, the followers of this guy who's based in Pennsylvania. His name is Fethullah Gulen. Um, and they, they, they tried to overthrow the Erdogan government. And what happened after that was Erdogan began to purge the military. And it used to be that the military, they were the secular ones. They were the pro-Western, pro-Israeli, pro-American uh, allies that uh, always kind of kept a lid on whatever Islamist sentiment may have been brewing in Turkey. Um, you saw a purging of, 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 the, of the good guys, as I would call it. How many of them are still left at those lower levels? I don't know. But, the, the, but, the, but Erdogan has tried to engineer a new military that is more loyal to him. Whether that has pervaded the culture there remains to be seen. I don't think we're going to find out until Erdogan is gone. And then we'll find out what he has left in his wake. In other words, whether the, the military is able to come back from this. But I'll also just mention this, Steve. The, the judiciary is a problem. The police is a problem. The bureaucracy in Turkey, which used to be, you know, middle of the road, you know, I don't want to say it was fully functional, but, you know, it, it was uh, better than just about every other country in the Middle East. This was a country on the edge of Europe and acted like a country on the edge of Europe. We don't know whether the country can function as a normal non-jihad supporting state once Erdogan's gone. It's a thought experiment right now. Uh, hopefully we'll find out soon enough when Erdogan eventually goes what this means for the future of Turkish-Israeli relations, U.S.-Turkish relations, you know, European-Turkish relations, because the Europeans are really unhappy with what they've seen as well. It's been a total deterioration of a country that was once seen as a bulwark against radicalism, and now it's a champion of radicalism in the region. Yeah. So, so you're saying it's really hard to know where is the Turkish street? Is the Turkish street, you know, radical Islam? 
is a Turkish street moderate Islam? Is a Turkish street secular? It's, it's hard There's to a know. Base. There's a base that supports the AK Party, the Justice and Development Party, also known as the AKP. There is a solid base, and this is what has given Erdogan win after win at the ballot box. Now, there is an open question about whether he has engineered those wins at the ballot box. Um, I think, you know, uh, there's a possibility that he may have tampered with votes in the past. But when people look at what just happened in these municipal elections, they're saying, I mean, it's funny, the, the supporters of the government in Turkey are joking that it's the worst dictatorship ever if Erdogan would allow for a victory of his opposition in the municipal elections. But it may have just been so overwhelming um, that uh, there, there was no way to tamper with the votes. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, what we're looking at is a possible unraveling of his base of support. That's our hope. Mm -hmm. And I know you're limited in time. If I can, can ask you to spend some time speaking about the North, you know, I'll give you an example. We've heard from the generals from day one, there was a 50-50 chance that this is a full-out war. Now we're hearing it's more like a 70 to 80 percent chance that there's going to be a war up north. You know, again, no, no one knows. It's very fragile. You know, any particular event could, could set off, a, could set up a war. What's your take, both from a, a, your analysis of the Iranians and your analysis of the Hezbollah? Look, I, I think Hezbollah doesn't want a full on war right now. That's the assessment that we have that they, they are nervous, that they know that they would pay the ultimate price. They, 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 they're a one-time use, this group at this point, right? Israel has already made it clear what they call their Dahia doctrine, that if a war, a full war does break out in the North, Hezbollah will not be around to assess the fallout. Um, and so knowing that, Hezbollah has to be very careful. The Israelis have them deterred to a point. The problem is, is that they don't have them fully deterred. Um, and what we know is that, uh, you know, Hezbollah's had some successes in this war. They've, they've hit some strategic targets belonging to Israel, including an airbase. They have, I think more importantly, they've cleared out more than 100,000 people from the northern communities. That is a major victory for Hezbollah, and they know it. Uh, but they also know that the Israelis, if and when the gloves drop, so to speak, there will be not a lot left of this group. Now, I understand it that the Israelis probably need a few small pieces to fully assemble what's needed to conduct the war that they want to wage against Hezbollah. But I also know that they're ready now and that they're not going to flinch if they are pushed. And so that's the big question. Now, here's what I'm watching at this moment, because you know, there's there's a lot of uh, obviously there, there there's a lot of question marks about what might set this off, but I would argue that right now we're probably at the most dangerous moment that I've seen in terms of an all-out conflict between Iran and Israel. After Israel's attack on that senior IRGC official last week, they killed the 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 guy that uh, was purportedly sitting on the decision-making council of Hezbollah. Uh, working with Hamas. He apparently was part of the planning of 10-7. So the Israelis took him out in a building immediately adjacent to the uh, the Iranian embassy in Damascus in Syria. Now the Iranians are threatening to respond directly. If they do, and then Israel responds directly to Iran, which is, I think, the plan. I, I have to say, I think there are some in Israel that are secretly hoping that you know Ir Iran subjects itself to a mistake of that magnitude, because then it means that it's, you know, uh, it's fair game for Israel to strike wherever they wish inside Iran, and the regime does not want to pay a price that steep. But this is where Hezbollah, I think, may be utilized, because you have to remember something. Hezbollah was created as a, uh, a forward force to protect Iranian interests. People think about it was only created to destroy Israel. And yes, I think that's their goal, but they won't do it, right? Israel's too strong to be destroyed by Hezbollah, but Hezbollah is there as, a, as an insurance policy for the regime in Iran. 
The regime knows that if it ever comes to blows with the United States or with Israel, that's when they activate Hezbollah to make it that much harder for Israel to uh, to to um, to to really inflict major damage on the regime. And so that insurance policy could come due here if we begin to see an escalation between Israel and Iran. And then there's, of course, just the regular garden variety miscalculation that Hezbollah could engage in here, which is what happened, if you remember, of course, in, tw in 2006. Hezbollah escalated and escalated, and finally the Israelis just said, that's enough, and they laid waste to a massive amount of Hezbollah infrastructure. That could happen too, and that's the stuff that we watch every day. So there's the daily concerns, and then there's the long-term concerns. Both of them are still very real, and you're right, you know, I've heard 50-50 from some folks, but I'm hearing that the chances are higher. No one actually wants to put a number on it. I don't know where you heard 70-80, but you know what? I, I wouldn't deny it. I would say that we're probably still very close to a confrontation that would be, it would lead to the messiest war in the Middle East that we have seen, I think, in our lifetimes. Messier than anything that we've seen up until now because Hezbollah is believed to have um, the strength of a, I mean, it's equal to a mid, mid-level European power, the kind of weaponry they have, the kinds of capabilities they have. Israel's never dealt with a power quite that fierce, and that will lead to some interesting decisions made by the Israelis, I think, early on in the war about how long they're going to want to let it go. And that would, I think, in, in, entail bringing out perhaps new weapons that Israel's not deployed up until now. Um, and it would absolutely, this Dahia doctrine that I mentioned, they have warned that pretty much every area controlled by Hezbollah will be destroyed. There will be no, you know, uh, no equivocation on the part of Israel. So this would be a war unlike anything we've seen. I certainly don't welcome it at all. Um, I hope that cooler heads can prevail, but the only way that happens is if Hezbollah agrees to send its forces north of the Latani River. This is, of course, in accordance with the UN Security Council Resolution 1701. If Hezbollah does this and they move their troops 20 miles north of the border, everything can go back to normal. But anything short of that means that we are still on war footing and will be for quite some time. Can I, can I challenge you on one thing that you said? Please. If a, if a war happens, I'm making an assumption the the launching capabilities, the depots of weapons, those kind of things will be destroyed. But my assumption is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Hezbollah itself will not be destroyed. Meaning we're not going to see Israeli forces going deep into Lebanon you know, for a protracted amount of time. My guess is this would be more of a, a an air war than it would be a ground war. Not to say that they won't use ground troops, but it'd be very different than what we're seeing in Gaza, where, where we literally control Gaza City, control Kanyunis, Jabalia, Beit Hanun, etc. Yeah, I, you know, it's a good question. My my sense is that there would have to be a ground operation in order to clear Hezbollah from the area south of Latani. Right. I do believe that something like that would be I mean, it would be a necessity for Israel because that's the only way that they allow for the people to come back. Now, I do think that, that this war would be heavily weighted toward air operations. Um, and, and that would be, I think, probably the first several weeks of this. But, you know, there is no way that Israel can tell that it's northern residents that they can return home until they have guaranteed that they have cleared out this southern area. And um, it's, of course, something that Hezbollah doesn't want to acquiesce to. Iran does not want to uh, see this either. Um, but, and you know, and you've probably seen this, that Amos Hochstein, uh, the special envoy to Lebanon for the Biden administration, has been trying to push all of this in the right direction and to get um, let, uh, Hezbollah to, to withdraw to this area. They're not buying it. Um, but that's, I think, that that area, that southern security zone, as we would call it, that's where ground troops are needed. That's where tanks are going to be needed. That's where the fighting would happen probably after the initial wave of assault that would neutralize, uh, you know, with, with any luck. 
the uh, the rocket stores, the missiles, the drones, the precision guided munitions, which I'm very concerned about, and any other advanced, what the Israelis call game changing weapons, you get rid of those and then it becomes a little bit easier for Israel to operate in that southern security area uh, and to establish that, that um, hopefully a DMZ of sorts uh, that would enable uh, a return to some normalcy for the Israeli population. In terms of any, your closing, closing thoughts, um, look, you mentioned that what Israel's done is, we've heard this from American generals, from British generals, what they've done in Gaza is just remarkable, especially with two arms tied behind their back. Share with us, I guess, some positive news, you know, as, as closing remarks. Yeah, Not because I mean, look, I'm uh, looking at the world through rose-colored glasses, just because mm -hmm. our participants always say, you know, give us some positive news as well. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, uh, I'll just say this, that I think to a certain extent, the political challenges that Israel is dealing with right now um, is a result of their astounding success on the battlefield. The Israelis are on the five-yard line. I mean, just to, be, to put it very clearly right now, right, they have, they have killed more than 12,000 Hamas fighters. They have injured another 10,000 or so. They have arrested another three or 4,000. There is about, let's say, four to 8,000 fighters left, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, et cetera. The, lar the vast majority of them are sitting in Rafah right now. They're in the in the tunnels and they're preparing for what I believe will be their last battle, their battle for survival, and they're going to lose it. The 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 concern here right now from the administration is the Israelis swept so quickly from north to south as they went from Gaza City to Khan Yunus and then finally ended up at Rafah. Yeah, they pushed Hamas, the surviving Hamas fighters, into Rafah, but they also pushed civilians into Rafah. So they are a victim of their own success right now. And so we're close. We're very close, I think, to watching the end of this thing play out. Now it's a question of the politics. It's a question of whether Biden is going to allow this to happen in the next month or two months or whatever the time frame is for him so that he feels like he can deal with Michigan voters and Pennsylvania voters. And uh, by the way, I'm not getting into the politics here, but we can clearly see that the president is impacted by the polls and by what the perception of, of, of how his base sees him. So he's dealing with that. That is a temporary problem. So again, I think that's positive. It's not a long-term challenge. It's something that the Israelis are gonna to need to work with the administration. They're gonna to need to clear out those 1.4 million people. That'll take about a month. And that's what I think we're gonna see that division resting while this, um, you know, this, this transfer of the population takes place internally inside Gaza for humanitarian reasons. So I think that we are still close. The other thing that I'll just tell you is when you look at the way in which the IDF has been able to, through intelligence, to target high value targets like that IRGC official in Syria, absolutely pinpoint intelligence, lethal and also limited, which is really impressive when we see what the Israelis are doing. We're seeing that their defense has been remarkable. The Israelis actually just fired Iron Dome off of a boat the other day, showing that they have new capabilities in missile defense, which is already, I mean, out, I mean, I think it's outperformed what anybody would think uh, when you see the kinds of um, uh, the success rate of Iron Dome, David Sling, as well as Arrow. Um, it's been nothing short of astounding how they performed. We are now stuck in a strange political moment. I talked about this on my podcast on the FDD Morning Brief just earlier this morning. I cannot recall another uh, war, foreign war, fought by a foreign power that has taken up so much attention from the White House and that has um, eaten up so much political attention here in this country. It is a truly bizarre spectacle for me You'd think that we just want to give a green light to the Israelis to finish this and to get it out of the headlines, but that's not what we're watching right now. And so it's bizarre days, um, but bizarre doesn't mean defeat. Bizarre means that we've paused while the Israelis and the United States figure out their next steps. And I do have faith, despite all the challenges, that the U.S.-Israel relationship will prevail. It will be intact by the time this is all done. And with any luck, the Israelis will get the green light that they need in order to finish off Rafa and move on to the next phase of this operation.
Wow. Jonathan, thank you. Thank you for your analysis. And thank you for specifically because of the schedule you have that you made time for us. We're, we're very, very grateful. Um, I want just to share with, with our donors that as well as this major commitment we've made to PTSD, we're now making a number of significant commitments to funding the families of widows and orphans, to funding the bereaved families. All bereaved families will be receiving funding and there's gonna be a connection made between our donors and the families themselves. Please be in touch with your chapter directors. This is something that we're coming, a new program that the Ministry of Defense has asked us to fund, the, 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 what's called the Mishpachot Shulot, the, the division of the Ministry of Defense that deals with, with casualties, it deals with bereaved families. Um, it's going to be a very, very significant cost, a significant expense. It's something that will be multi-year, but it's the least that those who made the ultimate sacrifice for Israel, the ultimate sacrifice for the Jewish nation, the ultimate sacrifice in the defense of Western civilization and humanity. It's the least that we can do. And we're honored and we're privileged to give this support, to fund this, and to partner with Israel's Ministry of Defense and with the IDF, looking after the bereaved families and looking after the families of widows and orphans. And thank you in advance for supporting this initiative. This initiative is gonna run millions of dollars, but it's something that is crucial, necessary, that at least as they're trying to rebuild their lives, rebuild their world, they don't have to deal with the economic burdens that come with this. Again, we'll be back on Sunday. We want to thank Jonathan. Jonathan has always been incredibly gracious to our organization. He's always given of his time. And we want to thank the FDD. The Foundation for the Defense of Democracies is, is that think tank that thoughtful, serious nations depend upon, rely upon, and ultimately give them the vision, give them the analysis, and give them the ability to hopefully make this world a much safer place to deal with Iran, to deal with Turkey, to deal with these nefarious actors like Qatar, Hamas, Iran, and Hezbollah. It's not a safe world we live in, but FDD is doing everything it can to make it a much safer place. Thank you.